and looks like we're live. Wonderful, it's great to be here. It's fantastic, I'm joined by outstanding people, Anna Shapiro, Suya Gangulai, uh, uh, Grace Lindsay, Blake Richards, and Matteo Carandini. And today we will talk about the space relating computation to a relating computation and learning. And I want to start a little bit with an own with the story of how I get exposed to the field of computation. So when I started as a as an as a student in Zurich, not even a PhD student, as I was an undergraduate, I think they call it master students these days. Um, Kevin Martin allowed me to watch one of his experiments. And this is one of these super classical experiments where you take a, where you take a cat you have the cat there and a, a loudspeaker is attached to a needle uh, and that is amplified and so every time that neuron spikes you feel a, you hear a little kick. and so then then uh, kevin martin would show like bars with different direction and you'd hear like kicks, kicks, <laughs> and just seeing that absolutely convinced me that this is the way to, to, to understand how a brain works. I think that vision, that this is the way to understand how brains work, um, are seen more, uh, with more nuance these days, both, both by me, and of course that's what happens last, but also generally by the field, both on the experimental side, where if uh, experimentalists look carefully at brain activity, um, it's not as simple. It's not that, that I can, for every neuron, I can kind of say, okay, this is the role that that neuron takes. It looks like it's experimentally very complicated, but also from a theoretical perspective, this level of specialization, we have a pretty good understanding now that that wouldn't even be helpful. And, um, and, and it's pretty clear that this old idea of this strong specialization and in each part of the brain, there's like one type of cell or even a small number of them that do one thing. And we can, as humans, basically figure out what they do and lead to an understanding of the brain, that this old computational neuroscience approach in a way is limited. And so coming from there, now I think we're in, an interest, in a really interesting time which is a lot of us are in a way looking for, okay, how should we do neuroscience going forward? And are we, we are really asking us that question. And suddenly I'm asking myself that question a lot. And there's a lot of, I myself have a lot of uncertainty about how to do that right. And at the same time, we're in this space where now we see two disciplines meet one another. We have the traditional discipline in a way based on the Yubel and Weasel primary visual cortex ways of, thinking about brains, but we at the same time have this artificial neural network field that is now progressively building systems that actually work, that gets us excited. And also along with that came a lot of thinking about how we should think about high dimensional spaces, not like the singular values of the, of the covariance matrices of the stimuli. And there's like a lot of different new ways of, of thinking about, about brains and old ways that we rediscover now. And so I think in that context, we, we, we are in a really interesting space because if we do science, it always, it always forces us in a way to look for simplicity. Not like if the brain is arbitrarily complicated, what are we going to do about it then? So we need to look for places where we can find simplicity. And there's this old idea that it, it's just what neurons do is simple. But there's a lot of new ways of thinking about it. You now, like where we can say maybe when we do dimensionality reduction, there's something simple there. Or maybe learning might be simple. And in that sense, I think we're in this space. So some other people say maybe if we look at the covariance matrix between recordings with fMRI, that leads to a simple understanding of how the brain works. So we have these different disciplines that are now looking for simplicity at different places. So now, and in, in, in as part of that, if you want, we are, we are reminded to think about the conflict between thinking of brains in terms of nature, in terms of how we are born, in terms of how of our DNA, and not show sure about the world in which we, uh, which we, uh, we start. So I, I, I want to, and, and that leads different of our panelists to different places. And I'd like to start with Blake Richards. So Blake, in a way you're making the point that a lot of 
computation approaches don't will not quite work out and that the hope is that on the learning side we could make big progress how how do you define this space for you well so i want to start with a kind of um funny counter story to the one you just gave. So when I first decided to shift into neuroscience, I did a, a master's where we did rotations in different labs so that we coming from non-neuroscience backgrounds could, could learn about neuroscience from different people. And I did a rotation in YF Bear's lab where we were studying visual processing and primary visual cortex. And uh, I was doing computational modeling for Wyeth, but he uh, graciously let me uh, sit in on some of the experiments. And I got exactly that experience you described of, you know, for my first time hearing neurons spike away as you gave the cat different orientation. I was a macaque, I think, a macaque different orientations of, uh, of bars. But one of the things that was really illuminating for me in that experience was also that what would happen is as we descended with the electrode, we would find a neuron and then we'd run a group of orientations and Wyeth had this beautiful software that would immediately plot out the neurons average spiking response to those orientations. And if we got a nice bell curve on the orientation selectivity, we would then proceed to do all our, our experiments. However, if we didn't, we just kept going with the electrode and the majority of the neurons that we found, we had to just keep on going with the electrode. And for me, that was really uh, surprising because I had kind of learned this story in my introductory neuroscience class as a master's student about Hubel and Weasel and how you know visual cortex was made up of simple and complex cells. And then here, a majority of the cells didn't seem to have clear orientation selectivity. And it 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 just it for me it was like, well, something's wrong here about the way that we're approaching this on some level. And I think. As I continue to gain more experience in neuroscience and, and increase my education, that feeling only cemented more and more for me. And, and what I came to was the feeling that the, the, I, the program that many people seem to envision as the fundamental program of neuroscience, of trying to come up with an explanation of what individual neurons in different circuits were computing was potentially hopelessly doomed. Now, I should say that that particular articulation of an idea that we're gonna come up with an account of what every individual neuron is computing in the brain might itself be a bit of a straw man. I think at this point in time, most neuroscientists would actually agree with that statement that I just made. And so it's not that I'm proposing anything radically different from what the field views, but to, to bring this back to a less straw man argument, I guess what I still think on some level is that when we try to ask that question of what would be the simplest way to understand a neural circuit and to understand it kind of what it's doing in terms of the algorithms that it's running, the computations that it's performing, um, how those algorithms are implemented by the circuit. It, my personal feeling is that the, the best route into that is to start by asking normative questions about what has this circuit been optimized for? And, that can be learning, but it can also be evolution, to be clear. I, I don't really need to distinguish between the two as far as I'm concerned. And so if you start with this question of like, what has this circuit been optimized for? Um, then you're kind of doing a top down approach where you, you ask the normative question, you try to figure out what the purpose of the circuit is on some level or what its purpose evolutionarily was. And then you can use that to try to uh, like a kind of simple account of its function to try to understand some of the stuff going on internally to it better. And in my mind, that's gonna be a way to develop these simple understandings that you articulated Conrad um, that will pay off in the long run. Whereas I think that if we try to go totally bottom up where we just like we trace out circuits, we record activity from cells and, and we do this without the top-down normative perspective of optimization, I don't think we'll get to a simple understanding. I think if we do it purely bottom-up, we're gonna have just this massive complicated laundry list of biological facts, which don't coalesce into a simple understanding. And so that's why the research program I envision is fundamentally this top-down guided one. So, but, but if I understand it right, you're not trying to deliver on the original promise. No? So, so at some level, 
if it is mostly learning, then if you want, your brain will reflect that Conrad totally arbitrarily has blue hair. He could have green hair, but like it's reflected somewhere. And that means that then there's nothing that guarantees us that the computation resulting from it will be understandable to anyone. No. So, so, well, so that's, that's part of it as well, I guess. And this is what you I think you're driving at here is um, I think that the ways in which we can understand a, a computation or an algorithm going on inside these circuits is precisely with an, an explication of say, you know, okay, here is the loss function that was being optimized by this circuit. And so that's why these are the sorts of things we see, because when we optimize neural network models, we see these sorts of things as well. So this is where you can compare the dynamics and the representations in neural network models that have been optimized on these things to real, neur real neural circuits to try to develop that understanding. Um, and I guess the, you know, your, you, what you articulated is indeed my perspective to some extent, which is that um, in contrast, I think if you, if you just try to understand it by looking at the data directly, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure you can, because I don't think there's necessarily a human interpretable story to tell based on that stuff. I think the human interpretable story is, in fact, this is the loss that was optimized. One, wonderful. Very clear. So, so I was wondering, maybe we should continue with Grace. So Grace wrote a wonderful book, in case anyone in this audience could have missed it, which gives a wonderful overview over the kind of modeling and brain research. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure she can tell a very nice, clean, high level story about like how she, what drives her way of doing research here. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to, to follow Blake too, because I think um, I want to be clear about maybe a distinction, this like top down versus bottom up. I think, you know, in computational neuroscience, people already can take a kind of combined top down, bottom up view. It's more nor normally talked about in like Mars levels way, where you say there's a computational goal to the system, and then you try to understand how it's implemented, which is, I think, meaningfully different from saying the system was optimized and caring about the loss function. You could argue that those those are different, and then you are shifting the focus of what people should try to understand. Um, the way I think about it is that, um, Certainly the uh, use of artificial neural networks, the kind of recent resurgence of them as models in neuroscience um, and my own personal research on trying to study them and understand them has made me nervous about uh, the endeavor of neuroscience and the ability to understand complex neural systems uh, using the tools that we currently use. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, been easy in neuroscience to always blame how hard it is to collect data on why maybe we don't have the level of understanding that we want. You can't make that argument in artificial neural networks. You can do any recording or any perturbation or any analysis you want to do on them. Um, and so it really puts the onus on people divide, uh, designing analysis methods for what do you actually want to do and what counts as understanding and um, yeah, do the analyses that you apply, even if they tell you a nice story in the end, can you then actually use that to do, you know, perturb the network and prove that your story was correct, that kind of thing. And I think, I think it's not coming out great <laughs> at the moment. Um, it's hard to understand these systems. Um, so I am concerned. Um, about the ability to understand computation, but I still believe that um, there are things that can be said about artificial neural networks and about the brain that we haven't said yet. There are statements about the computations that they perform that are, you know, somewhat simplified versions that aren't just a full description of the data and that we just need to find the right tools and the right language for those things. And it just might be vastly different than what we're doing now, because as we've talked about a lot of Current analysis methods are still based on the individual neuron and what it responds to, what it's tuned to. Even when you look at population methods, it's still a bit like, how does this population respond to this stimulus? And you're kind of just getting a picture of that. Um, so it could be that we need a radical rethinking of how we understand how to get at computation. But it still is the case that with an artificial neural network, there are a set of weights that will work on a task and a set of dynamics that those weights produce that will make the network able to do the task. And there's a whole much bigger, usually, set of weights that don't. And so there's something different about those things. And I want to believe that we can find that, you know, we can do more than just list the set of weights that work and list the set that don't. <laughs> I want to believe that we'd be able to come to some 
lower dimensional statement about what makes the neural network good at something and what makes it not good at it. Um, so I would say that the, the idea that the um, goal that we should aim for or the, the best we can hope for is to figure out what the loss function is, that would be kind of the worst case outcome for me. <laughs> it might be true, <laughs> but I think, I think there's going to be more that we can do uh, in between there. So what kind of statements about neural networks, what distinguishes these two regimes, what works and what doesn't work? Now, there's this, this one set of statements that Blake would probably be very happy, which is if it does gradient descent on something, it's going to work. If it doesn't, it's not going to work. But, but you want to have something that, that basically, yes, and, and I know I'm oversimplifying this, and I apo apologies for Blake here, but, but you, in a way, are looking for something that links the world and the neural network to distinguish what works versus what doesn't work, no? Well, yeah, if you're, if you're going to say, you know, if the ideal is that you can look at a set of weights or you can look at a set of dynamics in a network and say that network will be able to perform ImageNet and this network won't, um, then, yeah, the, the question is, you know, if ImageNet has to be baked into that. You do need to understand the statistics of the tasks that you're, um, you know, trying to assess the network on and all of that. But the hope would be that, yeah, there's something where aside from just training a network and just running it to see its performance, there's some way you could look at trained networks and know something about their ability to perform a certain task um, because there are big differences between networks that can and can't perform the same task. Yeah. Um, great. So why don't we continue from the, the, the biological side next? So I would like to hear from Matteo a little bit. So. Matteo, I learned a lot uh, because we were at the same place in Zurich where I got my PhD. And, uh, and he was always doing really cool hardcore physiology. And now he's doing like these amazing big data approaches. Matteo, how are you thinking about this space? Um, so I was very lucky. I have a big echo. I don't it's, know if it's, you have it's only on your echo. side. It's uh, it, uh, but we are hearing it. It could be that you have another uh, uh, another okay. uh, open window, and otherwise the emergency thing is you just talk talk and turn off your uh, turn off your loudspeaker. Okay, so I will not listen to myself. So I was lucky to be a. Um, PhD student at a time that was magical in the 1990s. I was at New York University with Tony Mofsham, and at the same time I was working with David Heger, who was at Stanford, and Eero Simoncelli was at Penn. And basically these three people figured out a bunch of laws of what individual neurons were doing and groups of neurons were doing in the visual cortex. Neurons were summing linearly uh, from their inputs, which at the time were thought to be in the visual field. Um, they were performing nonlinearity, squaring or um, uh, half max or something like that. Um, then they were doing normalization. Ah, you have you have echo too. So I'm going to stop talking and I'll come back to you because I might have another window. Open. <laughs> Wonderful. I agree with the feeling that there was a magical time back then, and we will hear more about the magical times later. Uh, why don't we continue? Uh, with with Anna in this case, so so Anna, you've you've been combining a view on human brains with a view on learning in a truly unique way. What is your view in this space? Yeah, I mean, so I'm interested in how we learn. Like that's the question that I'm interested in. So like the the answer to that question takes the form of like what is the learning rule? What is the objective function? So for me, like a satisfying explanation to the kinds of questions I'm interested in kind of takes the form of the of these like explanations that we're that we're talking about. Um, but I I feel like maybe a little bit more optimistic than Grace about like um, and maybe then 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 um, Blake about like what we can understand about these networks and what we do understand about these networks. And maybe that's just because the space that I'm working in, the networks are like more understandable or we uh, the, like the architectures are more specific and so that helps us under like get get some like handle on what's happening with representation so um i spent a lot of time thinking about the hippocampus which has very particular you know architectures and uh you know if we 
if we defined um, you know, a particular neural network architecture that matched the hippocampus and, and a learning rule and objective function that that did a good job of, you know, of um, remembering particular episodes, like that would be nice, but that would be really unsatisfying. And and I and I think that we're like already beyond that. So, you know, we understand that um, there's a certain kind of architecture in the dente gyrus that that has, you know, a connectivity that's very, you know, sparse and different than like just a, nor a vanilla deep neural network um, that leads to this phenomenon of pattern separation. And that means that there's a, you know, orthogonalization of, of inputs coming in that results in the ability to remember specific things without interference from other related things. And so there's this whole space of, of thinking about the different parts of the hippocampus and how they would contribute to those kinds of representations that support episodic memory. So like that, like, learning the understanding the learning rule there is real a really important part of the story but learn understanding the representations um and how they like perform the computations that result in in like useful something useful like episodic memory is also a really important part of the story so so i feel like i feel a little more optimistic i feel like um like learn like these these uh explanations in terms of um learning are super super important and at the heart of what i i care about but like um i think we can we can do more and we are doing more um at least in in this domain which again like might be might benefit from particular like architectures that that give us hints about what's happening wonderful again very clear and matteo tells us that he's ready for us matteo yeah sorry about that um I, I, you know, senior moment. Okay, so um, basically at that time, there was this idea that neurons were making these very simple computations and that they would repeat these computations across visual areas. This was all centered on the visual system. But then that program of work got stuck for at least two reasons. One was that it became impossible to describe effectively what neurons beyond V1 were doing in terms of simple operations on images. And the other reason is that it became really hard to explain why on earth, if you show five times the same image to a neuron, you get five pretty different responses. And so both of these problems are now solved. Um, the first problem has been solved because the artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks have shown that if you have enough of these layers, indeed, you can get to the point where you recognize a cat from a dog, which at the time we had no idea whether that was true or not. It was just a hope. The other thing that was amazing is that's amazing is that these networks actually use these three operations that these three guys figured out: linear filtering, max functions, and normalization, which is stunning to me. And then now we also are trying to understanding why there's this thing that at the time was considered noise, which is that if you show the same image five times, you get five different responses. And that has to do with all sorts of learning and interesting things, but also with the fact that neurons in the visual system are not only doing vision, but they're also connected to the rest of the brain. So I think that program of research has been going incredibly well, also thanks to the work of Di Carlo, etc. My personal quest now is to see what else neuroscience can give to you know AI, for example, and and I think there is a little hint of this in some recent work and and um, from Kenneth Harris, with whom I share the lab. We recorded um, with Carson Stringer and Marius Pacitario from about ten thousand neurons at once, and we showed them three thousand images, and we asked what was the dimensionality of the representation, and we found that it follows a very very precise power law. It turns out that with that power law the representation, the manifold that represents the images is not a fractal. If it's a fractal, you get the equivalent of adversarial images in convolutional neural networks. But in our brain, we don't have adversarial images, at least we haven't found one yet. Um, and so um, at least you cannot change one pixel and make me think that you are all at the beach, right? Um, and so and, and so possibly that has to do with the fact that the representation follows that power law. So I think the, the two challenges now from an experimental standpoint are understanding what these laws are, such as the power law, etc., and understanding what the rules are and stop hoping that we can go from stimuli to neural activity or from neural activity to actions directly, because as soon as things get interesting, you can go from neurons to neurons. And I'll just finish by saying that if you took a convolutional neural network now and you try to understand what the fourth layer was doing in terms of images, good luck. But if you were trying to understand what it does in terms of the third layer, easy peasy. 
So that's where we are in neuroscience. That's what we're trying one, to understand. Wonderful. Now. And um, I, I just want to, to mention one thing. I think a lot of people here on stage are also interested in what neuroscience can contribute to AI. And I, I want, want to keep that out of the discussion today. We will, we will, we, we probably should have a discussion about it at Neomatch Conference or wherever about what neuroscience can contribute there. And I think that that's a really nuanced, interesting discussion there. But today, I think I'd mostly want to focus on the other direction. And, um, and in that sense, it's great that we have Surya here. Uh, one of the things that I really love reading about uh, from Surya is that he really builds ideas on how we can at least understand certain aspects of how neural networks work. And in a way, there's always that hope that the ideas that we can use to understand neural networks might also generalize to brains. Now, in the same way as the things that don't work on microprocessors might be a little dicey at times when we talk about brains, debatable. But in that sense, I think developing techniques to understand neural networks is really interesting if we want to think about how brains work. So, so yeah, tell me a little about, or tell us a little about your approaches in that space. Uh, sure. Yeah. So um, I guess one thing to say is like, although I try to be as principled as possible in applying any particular approach, any particular problem, in terms of my selection of approaches, I try to be as unprincipled as possible. Like the brain is a hard problem. Like we'll take any method that's useful and we'll try to use it. So I've actually like done work where I take Blake's approach and, you know, apply normative models, try to derive from first principles neural circuits and so forth. Uh, and then at some point you got to decide like, did it succeed or not? And then at some point you have to compare the computation that emerges from optimization in your model to the computation that is seen in the brain. So at some level you have to compare computation in the brain and the model to assess whether or not that approach is uh, successful or not. And uh, you could potentially compare two computations without understanding either. That's a logical possibility. But to me, that I mean, that's fun, but it, it's not satisfying enough. I also do want to understand the computation. And to sharpen that question a little bit, I guess that the crux of the issue is the following. Let's say there's a particular computation you're interested in, say, motor control, language, whatever, that unfolds over hundreds of milliseconds, let's say. And the crux of the issue is, is the dynamical process in your brain that unfolds over hundreds of milliseconds a fundamentally irreducibly complex dynamical process for which there is no simpler description than that process itself. And I'm loath to believe that that can possibly be the case because we know that our computations are relatively robust. If they're robust, then their outcome can't depend on the detailed dynamics of every single neuron, which means there's probably a reduced simpler description. And we'd like to understand that description. Could we get that description in every possible situation? No. Can we get in in certain situations where the answer would be non-trivial enough to surprise us and give us joy? Yes. And the art of science lies in choosing the right problems that are complex enough such that the answer, if we found it, if we found a simpler description of the dynamics in itself, it would surprise us and give us joy. And, and, and so I try to do that uh, in situations where I can. So, so can you give maybe an example? So what are, what are the areas, what, what's the kind of phenomenon for which, no, it can't be complete. It will have to be approximate. So we have the dynamics in the brain. We will have dynamics in our model. How can, how, how can that link work? Or, or what, what's the yeah. kind of phenomenon that, that that research program should be able to describe? Yeah, so the way I like to think about it is uh, the way the way that it'd be nice to organize research is, is our goal is not to come up with the most accurate model of the brain or even a, a really good facsimile that comes from an optimization problem, right? It, we have this axis, which is the complexity of our models. And we have this, this axis, which is the, the predictive capacity of our models. And of course, a virtual facsimile of the brain would sit out here. It's very, very complex and, uh, and very, very accurate. And then the question is, as we, as we go down in complexity, we're gonna take a hit in predictive capacity but the question is like, how will the curve go? Will it drop like this, which is like the scenario of irreducible complexity, or will it drop gracefully like this? And our goal as scientists is to try to negotiate this Pareto optimal trade-off between complexity and accuracy and understanding lies in being able to negotiate this trade-off and say like, okay, I got a pretty good model, but maybe these aspects of the model are not that important and the final outcome is robust to it. So I can simplify it 
by coarse graining it somehow, whether it's dimension ion reduction, whether it's control three model reduction, whether it's information bottleneck, whether it's renormalization group, like all these different fields have developed various methods for simplifying complex systems. I think none of them by themselves are up to the task of attacking the brain, but that doesn't mean that we can't develop new techniques for doing that. Uh, so, so, so now having said that, it's very important to note that we don't know what numbers to put on the complexity axis and we don't know what numbers to put on the predictive accuracy axis like what is it that's worth predicting and what do we consider a complex versus simple model and that's a matter of research and a matter of uh, uh empirical uh it's going to be worked out empirically and, and theoretically together over over the course of decades right but isn't it also a matter of style it's also a matter of style right it's it's a question of what is it that's worth explaining i remember when i was in a job interview many years ago I was talking to a synaptic vesicle release person. And in the beginning of the interview, he said, Surya, we will never understand the brain if we don't understand how vesicles are released, right? And I, I politely nodded. And, and, uh, um, but, you know, it, it, it's a matter of style, right? I mean, now having said that, there are many diseases for which uh, very good drug targets attack the vesicle release mechanism, right? So in some sense, he's right for a certain set of questions. Um, but but what becomes important, of course, depends on the question you're asking. So so I, I think this is something that probably most of the panel will agree on that we're basically trying to find these points on the Pareto surface. But but I like for for purposes of the discussion to make it concrete. So I'd like to encourage all of you, if you if you if you feel that's doable, well, to kind of sketch how you're gonna or like like which parts of that that surface is particularly interesting to you. But why don't we start with Matteo, who well, I think I'm just wanted thinking to say something. That we probably all share a hope that there is a decoupling of circuits from cognition and that the decoupling can be summarized by computation. Because if it's not like that, we're kind of screwed. We're, we're not going to understand how. I think we share this. You can tell me if you agree or not. If, if we can't describe the brain in terms of computation, we then need to understand how 90 billion neurons are connected to each other and in all glorious detail. And, and it's hard. Now, I think Blake would advocate an even simpler thing, which is not even that you'd have to understand computation, but you just have to understand the learning rule. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I think we have this hope, but what if it's not like that? So, for example, to understand how a computer works, it really helps to understand the level of operating systems, programs, um, and it decouples you completely from the hardware. And, right, you don't really need to know anything about the hardware to understand how, how a computer works at that level. The question we have is whether the brain actually can be explained at the level of computations. And I think some of you would push it further and say, dude, don't worry about computation, just wor worry about learning. But do we agree on the basics that we need to understand computation and that that might be enough? So, so I, I want to dwell on this because I think this is exactly like the kind of fundamental disagreement that I think is really important to understand. So um, in a way, what we just heard is that Matteo would never be satisfied with an understanding of the brain where it's basically, okay, this is what's being optimized. You take it that you can't understand it. The way I understand Blake's point, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that Blake in a way is fine saying, look, I can understand this is what it optimizes, what it comes up with, I don't understand. So, so is, is it fair to say that you, you have a genuine disagreement in what you mean with understanding here? So, yeah, I mean, I think so, because indeed, I, I am perfectly comfortable with the idea that if we, like, it doesn't bother me in the way it bothers Grace, for example, the idea that we might just only be able to understand the brain through ensembles of loss functions and architecture descriptions related to those losses. Now, to just touch back on this question of this complexity curve, though, the way I'd want to phrase it is, you know, this is ultimately a multidimensional curve. There are many different dimensions on which you can reduce the complexity of your model, and not all of them are going to have equal curvature with respect to that predictive power. And so I actually think that the question that we're debating here, the, the potential source of disagreement is which of the dimensions 
are going to keep us in the nice predictive range and which are the dimensions as we reduce the complexity, you're going to see a rapid drop off on predictability. And I suppose that, you know, the, the thing that I'm articulating is precisely that I suspect that we'll be able to push pretty far on simplifying, you know, the networks that we, the way that we model networks in terms of many of the biological details of the network and how they operate, many of the details of the computations that specific cells engage in, but that if we push in the wrong direction on like the losses that were being optimized, we'll just boom, lose predictive power immediately. And so that's why I feel like to some extent, I'm comfortable with models that maybe, and also attempts at understanding neural circuits that maybe don't always focus on a lot of these, these other things and instead focus on the question of what's being optimized precisely because I feel like that's the dimension where we're gonna get the most bang for the buck in terms of this complexity curve trade-off. So, so am I right with assuming that the the sympathies of of the remaining three of you, Grace, Anna, and Soya, lie with at some level you want to deliver on Matthias's promise? No. I mean, in terms of you know where on the complexity curve you fall, I think it is a matter of what question you're asking. I mean, I think ideally we'd be able to kind of zoom in and find an answer that falls on any point for any system, uh, you know, that people are studying. Because on some level, at least for me, you know, if you want to uh, offer something that explains the whole brain, I think the universal approximation theorem that says that infinitely wide neural networks can implement any function, like that's a pretty satisfying answer to me. That grounds me in believing that brains can do intelligent things because they can implement any function. And so that's just a broad statement that can explain the whole brain. But then we go into, okay, what is the actual neural network that, you know, is doing that? And what is the function it's implementing? And how does it uh, learn the weights that it needs to have? Um, so it's really, I think, People can ask questions at any level and they're going to get different answers. Sometimes where the problem comes is people have a misalignment between the level that they're asking the question and the kind of level at which they're applying an analysis that could produce an answer. If there's a misalignment there, I think that's a problem. But you should ideally be able to kind of get any kind of model you want at any point on that curve um, if we've kind of fully done neuroscience. So, so what a, what about the rest? Wait, uh, Anna, what, what's the, yeah, what's I your mean, view? I, I, I am very sympathetic to Blake's like a, to approach that like we will make a lot of progress by starting top down and thinking about the optimization problem and like and the learning rule and um, and so I'm very sympathetic to that and then I think and I don't think Blake disagrees like I just think we shouldn't just give up once we like come up with the model that does a good job of of predicting you know if we have that model right like we can then understand the model um or we can endeavor to understand that model um but i like i i basically am um like I, well so then in that case can you I, I like, could you or blake give an example of success of that research program i mean i think that the well, I mean, I'm not a vision person, so maybe <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but like, I, I think the, the correspondence with these Convenets and IT cortexes is, is is amazing and inspiring, and like the the um, the the kinds of representations that you see in these networks, like they they t to some level of approximation makes sense, right? You can look at them and say, like, I understand that like there's a certain similarity structure here that um, that's useful for like for the task that they're performing, and um, and so that's like, yeah, I think that's that's for me that's a big success. Yeah, I I would want to add one other success to this. Um, so you know. I think it can be very hard to interpret a lot of neural data related to action selection and the response to rewards. But once you start viewing it through the lens of reinforcement learning and optimizing for maximizing rewards with a bootstrapped estimate of value, all of a sudden a bunch of neural data makes sense. And, and that's an example of where a top-down perspective really helped to make previous data that was very hard to interpret, interpretable, courtesy of a specific 
in this case, not a loss, but a specific thing that you're trying to uh, maximize and, and optimize on. So, so I briefly want to ask Alana Jones's question because it's been very popular in that list and she would probably kill me if I don't ask her question. Um, so, so, so she asked in a way, she'd like you to be more precise about what you mean with understand. And, and I, think, I think that like Surya's understanding is just navigating this complexity versus uh, uh, complexity versus explained variance trade-off. That's not all of it. They, uh, understand means something much deeper, I think, for us. So, so, so uh, why, why don't you all chime in kind of what it means for you to understand here? Yeah, I mean, Richard Feynman had a nice kind of explanation of like, you know, you understand a theory if you can say something about the solutions to the equations of that theory without actually solving the equations, right? So like case in point, like fluid mechanics, right? If you, if the only way you could predict fluid flows is by numerically integrating the Navier-Stokes equations, then you'd be loath to say you have some intuitive understanding of fluid flow, right? But we can actually predict at a coarse grain level approximately what will happen in many fluid flows, right? Similar to that of a complex neural model, like um, let's say we have a really good model of the visual circuit, right? But we can't explain how it will respond in certain situations qualitatively. Then I'd be loath to say that we sort of understand it. Actually, we we faced this problem with with the retina, right? We we had a we came up with like to, to our knowledge the the world's best uh, model of the retina to natural movies. Okay, we trained it on like 20 years of uh, we, we tested it. We trained it in natural stimuli. We tested it on 20 years of uh, experiments, and we got all those experiments right. One of them was the emitted oh. stimulus response. You show a full field flash, the retina will fire. And then suddenly you emit a flash, the retina will fire even more, right? So it's as if the retina learned the predictive model of the world, and then it, it signaled a violation of that, of that model, of that prediction, right? Why is our big neural network giving us that response? It's a qualitative question that demands a qualitative answer, and we needed to do further work to extract why that was happening. It involved model reduction, a judicious algorithmic approach, reducing the complexity of the model without throwing out its predictive capacity for one particular stimulus, right? So things like that, I, I think are, and, and then we felt satisfied, right? And I'll throw out a, a, a thorn in, in it. Understanding is fundamentally a subjective human quality. It doesn't exist outside of the mind of the person who claims the understanding. So in some sense, we as scientists may be no better than artists. Understanding is like beauty. Artists are in search of it. They kind of know it when they see it, though they have some disagreements about it. And that's okay, right? We're kind of entertaining each other with our own sort of understanding, and we hope that other people will appreciate our understanding. And, and so we have to remember that the, the pursuit of science is in some sense subjective. Um, so I'll just throw that bomb out there and leave it, leave it at <laughs> So, so it's it's a bit about unexpected predictions. Arguably, much of art has that too, no? Yeah, it, it's a bit about that. But I, I think the heuristic yeah. is the following. It's like an Occam's razor heuristic. If we can explain the most amount of experimental data with the least amount of theoretical input, we tend to love such theories, right? And, and so, so that's what we'd like. You know, that that's kind so, of what we try to strive for. I I totally agree, and and I think in fact that people work well together when they agree on what constitutes an, an answer to a, a question, right? And so you and the vesicle scientist might not be a good companions uh, because you disagree on what constitutes an answer, right? And Or, or you might be great companions, I don't know. But, but, but what I'm fascinated by is whether there is a continuum of levels at which one could say I'm satisfied with the answer or whether there are discrete levels at which things decouple. So from my very limited understanding of physics, of um, solid matter, um, you can have equations that are fantastic when you have a couple of particles or three particles, but as soon as you have like five particles, these equations stop working. And now, th and then things start working again at a totally different level of not even billions, but like lots of 10 to the somethings uh, of particles. And then you have fantastic equations again. And so in between those two levels, you better not hang out in between those two levels, 
right? And so I'm wondering whether in neuroscience we're in a similar situation. So the vesicle person is going to have that level and maybe there are valid answers at that level. And then maybe there's a bunch of levels where you really don't want to hang out. And then there's the circuits person. And then there's Surya. And then there's Blake. Um, but you see what I mean? Um, and I'm curious whether there's decoupling. And if there isn't decoupling, I think we're in deep trouble. And so in print, so in, similarly, you know, if you want to understand the economy, you certainly you don't need to think about the atoms of the individual people, right? But there's various levels in there that decouple things and that help. No, I'm not sure we understand the economy that well. Hopefully we'll understand the brain better. Anyway, I better shut up. I spoke enough. <laughs> So, so, so I was wondering, Grace, you, you wrote a wonderful book, uh, in a way, summarizing our field for the world. Um, what, what, what would you say is like the overall summary of, uh, of what people mean with understanding in the field? Now they, you must have seen certain common trends. Yeah, well, usually, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the book is set in a mathematical modeling, which always involves letting go of some details. So the trend is usually that you acknowledge that you don't have to understand certain components or, you know, what you're trying to understand is it's going to determine which components matter or not. So um, I think this this notion um, that Sari put forth of, you know, this uh, ability to to predict without having to run a simulation to actually in your mind predict is related to sometimes why people build mathematical models or like mathematical models because they're these reduced abstract things yet ironically they're also the things that let us run simulations so that we don't understand um, so it's kind of it can definitely go both ways the models themselves don't make it so that you get an intuitive understanding and i think that's why we started this talking about artificial neural networks because you could train them You've built them entirely, but you don't know how they work. At least, you know, that's the common refrain. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think this the idea that understanding is different to different people and different in different circumstances. And someone who studied a single cell type in the fly for 20 years can say that they have an understanding that I won't be able to have because I'll need 20 years to get to it or whatever it is. They still have that understanding. They could probably have intuitions and predictions about, um, you know, what that cell type will do under different circumstances. Uh, and so we just have to accept at some level that understanding is different for different people um, and different for different questions. I would just go back to the the notion of, you know, the problem occurs when within a person, within a research area, there isn't clarity on what the goal is. I think that's what the issue is in uh, a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let me. We we only have a few more minutes, but I want to highlight another dimension where I think there's significant disagreement within the panel, and and where we can benefit from some clarity. Now, like Blake said it very clearly, like he has a top-down view. So, in a way, a top-down view is, I think, the way. And and again, I'm putting words into Blake, but in a way, like. I think the way Blake is thinking about it, what's the problem that's to be solved? Say, be as efficient as possible at solving a given pattern recognition problem or something, at, at, at detecting objects or something like that. And then he starts with that and basically uses that to go towards real phenomena. And, and so at some level, systems that work is what everything is built on because you cannot build top-down models unless you have really built systems that work. And then there's the bottom up. Let's look at, as Matteo so nicely put it, now like there's these, these rules if we look at individual neurons. So how, how does, where does everyone stand on this axis? And, and how useful are those two trends for you? And I'd like to not start with uh, with Blake or Matteo because I think for those uh, for them we kind of understand at least where their personal history ran. Maybe 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 we should start with Surya in that case. Sorry, I I missed the key thing about what the two axes were. I was looking at the track. So, so it's just oh. now about the about uh, the use of top down thinking. Basically, what's the problem and how can solutions look like versus use of bottom up thinking. Here's what individual neurons do what does that mean about bigger principles yeah now there's like the, said, that, I'm, completely, i'm completely unprincipled about what approach i take i mean i i, I use the top down i use the bottom up we got to make a meet like everybody should work together hang out together like exchange ideas i i think uh I, you know i i think it's extremely important to confront the top-down approaches through experimental tests with bottom-up details 
and, and bottom up alone will never get us there. Like we, we have to we have to like think about the reason for the existence of a brain circuit in order to understand it, right? Like, uh, um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's these famous quotes, right? Nothing uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, the analog of that in neuroscience. Is nothing in neuroscience makes sense except in the light of behavior. Uh, you know, behavior itself might not even make sense within the context of the evolutionary arms race that that evolved that behavior. So all of these levels are interlinked. And I think the business, I, I noticed in the science, in the chat, there was this crazy comment made by some PI that bridging levels is not important. I think bridging levels is a lifeblood of science, right? Like physics had this in stat mech to thermodynamics, like uh, engineers have this in going from transistors to computation. They do it by trying to decouple levels as much as possible and building in ab abstractions. Evolution has done it. It has built in robust systems with uh, you know, chemical modules, cells, circuits, you know, brain regions. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, by bridging levels, you can go both ways and you have to. And, and woe to the scientist who picks only one way to do it. So, so Anna, what about you? How much does your thinking about brains, how much is it influenced by thinking about the problem to be solved versus the data that we get out of neuroscience? Yeah, I, I, I said this earlier, like I, I tend to be more top down. I mean, maybe that's partly because I study humans and our methods are a little coarser. And so <laughs> so it kind of it's like easier to be top down in a way. But um, but I mean, like we have to we need data like we need data early in the process, not at the end of the process. Right. If you wait until you have your model. Um, and then it's all built and it's all optimized. And then you say, okay, like now I'm going to go and check and see what, like what's happening in the brain. Like that won't work. Right. We need to, we need a lot of information about the architecture. Right. We probably need a lot of information about the way that, um, that like possibilities for learning rules before we even like start to make the model. So like, it has to be a back and forth, right? Like you, it has to be a back and forth. And, and so, you know, uh, we, there are things that we know about the brain from like dumb, boring, exploratory, like, let's just look and see what, what there is. Um, and that in, informs our, our model building in really important ways. Um, and, and it, and it goes back and forth, but the kind of research that I like personally am engaged in and find like most, um, exciting is, is, is the kind of research that I guess, well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad there's all kinds of people, right? Like Surya is saying, I'm glad there's people who, who don't think this way, but the way that I think is like, is is a little bit more on the top down side um let's like let's define the the problem and 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 the um and the learning rule and let's see what kinds of representations we get now let's look, go you know check in the brain and see if we see those representations and okay and now let's try to understand like why do we see those representations why do they solve the task and um and so so i tend to be on on, on the more top down side but i think we need data all all the way and i'm sure i'm sure Blake would agree with that Maybe, maybe as a last person, Grace, where, where do you find your, how much do you find yourself using top down versus bottom up thinking? I think I'm very squarely in the middle because like Surya, I think that the fun of science and particularly neuroscience is connecting the levels. Like that's how I got into neuroscience. Like you can connect cells and they produce behavior and like, that's crazy. Um, so I like to be right in the middle, but I'm perfectly happy to have people who are very isolated at their own level because then I get to pull from their data to do the connecting myself. So I like reading, you know, a purely behavioral psychophysics study and a purely, um, you know, anatomy of the visual cortex study and then building a model that tries to link them. Um, so I think, yeah, we need people to do all different kinds of things, but to be the fun answer is how do these things connect? Now, unfortunately, I, we will need to stop roughly here. Uh, we could easily have spent the whole time taking a small part of the overall puzzle that we've been, uh, that we've been talking about. Um, I want to take the time to thank all panelists. I, I love the level of clarity and, uh, and also the fact that you all, in a way, totally agree with one another, which which is good in a way. Um, and I hope that was uh, that was useful for everyone who saw it. And so let's thank all the all the panelists again. It's the first time you get to hear, to hear like not very loud clapping here. And thanks for participating. And thanks for the audience for the great questions. Thanks so much. And bye bye. Thanks for having us.